Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for today's Wednesday webinar. I'm going to give it just a moment before we go ahead and get started. I hope you're all doing well and having a great day today. Thank you so much for joining. Okay. All righty. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on multi-year factor eight expression after AAV gene transfer for hemophilia A. My name is Alsa Murtha and I'm the manager of strategic communications here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will post to our speaker after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, May 6th. I'm joined today by Dr. Lindsay George. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you to get started. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today on, uh, of course, one of my favorite topics. Um, so um, I guess what we'll go over over the next approximate hour or so are the uh, recent, the published data um, uh, late last year of the uh, phase one, two trial for uh, hemophilia A gene therapy. Uh, the trial was sponsored by Spark Therapeutics. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm Lindsay George, I'm from the University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, so by way of outline, um, you know, I think that the, the my main focus of the talk is, of course, to talk about the trial results. Um, and then I just, as a brief outline, so you know where we'll be headed over the next approximate hour, is I, I just want to give a very brief background of, of AV, uh, sort of the strategy for AV mediated gene transfer that's currently in the clinic for hemophilia A and hemophilia B, and where we are in current progress. Um, just an outline of the, briefly of the trials that are ongoing. And then I'll review the, the publication on the safety and preliminary efficacy, efficacy of the SPK8011 vector. Um, and then how these data sit, with, particularly with respect to longitudinal durability, with respect to trial results that um, have been observed in other hemophilia A gene therapy efforts. So um, very briefly, uh, so that we're um, all on the same page as a, a general background of, of the current approach for gene therapy uh, for hemophilia. So the vast majority of of clinical trial efforts have coalesced around the use of adeno-associated viral vectors or AV vectors um, that are delivered systemically to target the liver for expression of either the factor eight or factor nine protein. Um, so the vectors are delivered by um, peripheral intravenous infusion. Um, there are um, both properties of the vector as well as the sort of inherent um, blood supply of the liver that permit um, uh, the vector to efficiently travel to the liver. Um, and um, thereafter, the goal is for uh, transduction of your uh, target cell of interest, which in our case are hepatocytes. Um, so you have uh, transduction um, of vector particles, which are, are carrying your um, uh, DNA cassette for expression of either factor eight or factor nine protein. Um, the uh, 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 cassette or the, tr the actual transgene um, uh, the ultimate goal here is that you would have an episomally uh, maintained transgene that could, um, again, not necessarily uh, be not be integrated into the host DNA, but um, uh, be located episomally in, in the nucleus of the target cell and and have um, uh, therapeutic expression of either the factor eight or factor nine protein. The properties of the expression cassette um, uh, regulate expression of your desired protein, so the the promoter. Um, and uh, all hemophilia A and B gene therapy efforts are using uh, what are thought to be hepatocyte specific promoters so that you have driving expression of either factor eight or factor nine protein in hepatocytes. Notably, hepatocytes are uh, the endogenous location of factor nine synthesis, but are not um, the uh, natural site of, of factor eight synthesis. Um, uh, AAV, uh, just a very brief background, but AV is a, a naturally occurring uh, virus, is a member of the parvovirus family. Um, and from a, a development of a therapeutic, it's not, not known to be pathogenic in humans. 
Um, and it's actually replication defective, both of which I think are, are important for considering the safety of using AV vectors. Um, but what we what are done with AV vectors is that the, um, the vast majority of the AV wild type genome is essentially gutted um, and replaced with um, either regulatory elements, uh, to, regulatory elements to express a transgene of interest. So you maintain um, the only part of the wild type I AV viruses maintained are the ITRs, the inferior terminal repeats that are necessary for uh, packaging and, and, and maintaining a stable episome uh, post transduction in your target tissue. Um, as I mentioned, AV vector, recombinant AV vectors are replication defective. Um, they have no uh, wild type viral coding sequences. Um, and then from the standpoint of, of what we're aiming to develop AV vectors for, um, they have um, tropism for long-lived post-mitotic cells. So they don't require cells to be going under, undergoing cellular division for um, transduction. Um, and this is important for, you know, in our case, we're, we're targeting hepatocytes, which are far and away the senescent cells that are not uh, actively dividing. AV vectors are predominantly non-integrating, which um, from the standpoint of, of concerns around integration, theoretical integration risks and, and genotoxicity, that's a positive thing when you're thinking about safety. Um, that's uh, potentially problematic if you're trying to treat um, rapidly dividing cells, such as uh, trying to treat a neonate or something of that nature, or, or a patient of that nature. Um, and then lastly, just as a, a very important practical point, um, the uh, uh, AV vectors can, you know, as I mentioned, can package somewhere around uh, 4.7 KB, uh, a little bit, uh, perhaps a little bit more. Um, and this is sufficient for um, uh, packaging the cDNA of both uh, factor nine, as well as a, a B domained pleated uh, version of, of factor eight. So um, here's uh, best I uh, at the current state of actively enrolling clinical trials for hemophilia A and B. Um, I just wanted to outline uh, briefly the you know this is uh, uh, sponsors, and then there are um, a multitude of variables um, between the vectors being used. Um, even if, even though they're targeting the, um, the same transgene. Um, with respect to factor nine work, um, all currently actively enrolling trials are using the factor nine part of a transgene. This is a naturally occurring gain of function mutation and imparts about eightfold greater specific activity. Um, and I think, you know, importantly, uh, two vectors for hemophilia B are um, in, in phase three clinical development. Uh, the data from the Unicure pivotal trial were um, announced at uh, EHAD in February. And the data from the Pfizer hemophilia B trial, um, originally sponsored by Spark Therapeutics, um, is uh, again, currently in, in phase three trial and the, the data from this trial are anticipated in the first quarter of 2023. And then moving to the topic uh, for today, hemophilia A, um, there are a number of hemophilia A gene therapy trials that are ongoing, including uh, two phase three trials um, the, the trial by uh, sponsored by Pfizer and Sangamo is, is currently on hold. Um, however, the phase three trial for uh, Byron is actually, um, you know, announced and actually published data from this trial. And I think many anticipate this vector may be approved uh, perhaps in this calendar year. So uh, um, I wanted to outline something. So before going into the data um, of the individual trial, I wanted to provide a perspective that I think is actually quite important um, as a, a clinician um, advising uh, patients and enrolling patients on a clinical trial, which I, which perhaps may be underappreciated, um, which is to really highlight the role of AV neutralizing antibodies. So um, uh, again, going uh, going before going into the data, um, so. AV neutralizing antibodies or IgG antibodies that, um, as you might expect, um, when uh, and encountering uh, when, when present in the serum, encounter uh, viral vector particles, bind um, and effectively neutralize uh, viral vector particles, which in, in turn um, inhibit them from uh, reaching a target tissue in transduction and therefore efficacy. The true seroprevalence of uh, various AV neutralizing antibodies to um, a variety of AV serotypes is, is not known and is highly dependent on the assay methods used, as well as conceivably the cohort of patients analyzed. And of course, there's no standardization of these AV neutralizing antibodies across uh, trials. And I think the perspective that I think is really important on the clinical side when thinking about AV vectors is I think these AV neutralizing antibodies um, are particularly important to keep in mind because they, they really um, uh, highlight the importance of, of really choosing 
um, the vector that you um, advise your patients on quite carefully. Um, so these are data, a very small cohort of patients, just three patients, um, who were the first patients to ever receive a systemic AEV vector. Um, they happen to be patients, uh, hemophilia B patients. And I think what's important is that these men, you know, they were treated in the early 2000s um, and subsequently followed for approximately 15 years. Um, the vector serotype used was an AEV2 vector. And um, you can see that, you know, but uh, well, well after 10 years post vector, these, these men maintained high titer neutralizing antibodies to AEV2. And actually these neutralizing antibodies were uh, multi-serotype cross-reactive. So uh, after you receive a systemic AAV vector, patients universally develop high titer neutralizing antibodies to uh, the infused AAV capsid. And among the patients that have been tested, um, the neutralizing antibodies, um, uh, the titers are quite high, not, not only to um, the infused serotype, but to all other serotypes tested. Um, and so these data, as I you know, outlined here, are as a small cohort, but this has been looked at in a larger cohort of, of gene therapy patients by the Biomarin group, um, a little over 10 patients, again, showing high titer neutralizing antibodies to the inf infused serotype, as well as um, all their serotypes tested. Um, and this uh, is consistent with what we know about environmental exposure to AV. You know, we know that patients that once they have AV neutralizing antibodies, they are uh, persistent um, and they're multi-serotype cross-reactive. And then this is again, consistent with what we've seen in, in animal data post-systemic AV. So I wanted to highlight the role of AV neutralizing antibodies before talking about the clinical trial data, um, namely because once you infuse a systemic AV vector, patients universally develop high titer neutralizing antibodies that um, in, in this, when, when we've actually looked, are actually looked to be multi-serotype cross-reactive. And, and this is a very important point because in the current state of clinical development, it's highly unlikely that after you read, you know, I, I would guess I'll say this, in this current state of clinical development, it looks as though you can only receive one lifetime systemic A vector, which in essence is actually the goal of therapy. But it also puts a lot of gravity or a lot of emphasis on, uh, you know, which vector you choose because you may indeed only have um, one um, opportunity for a systemic AV vector in your lifetime. So I'm emphasizing this because I think the details of the individual trials matter quite a lot. And I think it's very important to have a, a strong understanding of the vector as well as the available clinical trial data uh, when choosing um, uh, the vector for either yourself or uh, for patients. So um, with that perspective, I wanted to dive into uh, data. Um, this is a, a published a paper that's published in the New England Journal late last year um, as a, a large group of people. And so I'm honored to present on behalf of, of all the co-authors. Um, the, let me just tell you a little bit about the vector. The um, AV serotype used um, uh, for the SBK8011 vector was a, a bioengineered capsid LK03, um, which uh, has been given the commercial name of SPK100. Um, this um, uh, capsid was bioengineered by uh, Marquet's group at Stanford. Um, he used, um, and I apologize, I don't have time to go into the methodology as, as, as much as I would like, but um, for those familiar with this, he used a, a, a capsid shuffling technique um, and so the LK03 um, uh, capsid consists of, you could think of it as components of naturally occurring serotypes um, and the relative contribution of, of um, each of these listed naturally occurring serotypes are is schematically represented here. And, and um, I think that maybe the relevant point here is that the bulk of the LK03 capsid, which again is the capsid used uh, with the vector of the data all outlined shortly, uh, the bulk of it is derived from AAV3. What uh, the, the group outlined is, is, you know, the goal was to develop an AAV capsid, bioengineering AV capsid that had uh, theoretically um, improved um, uh, transduction of human hepatocytes. Um, and this is just some uh, primary data from the development. So um, this is looking at an in vitro transduction assay of human hepatocytes, um, looking at, so you have plated human hepatocytes and um, you come in with your AV serotype expressing essentially a reporter, block, reporter gene, which is a firefly luciferase. Um, and you can see here that the, uh, um, 
the expression of the uh, firefly or luciferase or re essentially reporter gene is, is most impressive with the LKO3. And, and this is, um, yeah, you can see some of the comparisons here. So for example, the AAV8, which has been used um, in other uh, uh, hemophilia gene therapy trials. So at least in this in vitro assay, LKO3 looks quite impressive in terms of an improvement of transduction of human hepatocytes. And then going in vivo in a, in a chimeric mouse model, so this is a mouse model has been um, uh, partially re, uh, the liver has been um, partially re, re uh, populated by human hepatocytes. Um, so going in with an AV vector, the comparison here is this LKO3 bioengineer capsid relative to AV8. Um, using this uh, vector to look at um, expression of, a, again, a reporter gene, GFP. Um, and you can see that the relative percentage of transduced hepatocytes, human hepatocytes in this chimeric mouse model for LKO3 is, is uh, in, uh, quite significantly higher than AAV8. So um, this all together, this suggested that the LKO3 capsid would be, uh, would perform quite well in terms of transducing human hepatocytes. And, um, if there's one thing that uh, the work in, in hemophilia gene therapy development is, has taught us is that um, animal data doesn't always predict um, human observations, but it, it does sometimes. So um, this was the rationale for choosing the LKO3 uh, capsid. And then the rest of the, um, uh, this is intended to be a schematic of the expression cassette. So you have the ITRs, um, uh, in between the ITRs is your expression cassette. So you have a, what was used was a, a, a truncated uh, modified transferatin promoter, which is a hepatocyte specific promoter. And then the factor eight SQ transgene, this transgene is being used in, in nearly all of the hemophilia A gene therapy trials. So that the concept here is that um, the cDNA of the, of the full length protein is, is exceeds AV uh, vector packaging constraints. Um, and so this requires that you truncate the factor eight gene, um, which uh, essentially truncate the vast majority of the B domain, which has no known function and uh, no known procoagulant function. And so, Importantly, I'll say that this, um, so this encodes a specific B domain deleted version of factor eight called, called factor eight SQ. Importantly, the, this exact same amino acid uh, sequence has been used in uh, recombinant protein therapy uh, for you know, over two decades and has not shown any difference in, in uh, safety or clinical efficacy. So moving on now to the eligibility criteria of the trial. Um, so we enrolled adult males with factor eight uh, levels less than or equal to 2%. Patients had to have neutralizing antibody titers that were less than one to five to um, the employed AV serotype. Uh, patients had to have pretty hefty factor exposure, so greater than 150 factor exposure days and no history of an inhibitor. Um, so the concept here is that we wanted to um, uh, err on the side of caution and enroll patients that would be, you know, presumably much less likely to develop an inhibitor to the transgene derived protein. Um, patients could not have active hepatitis B or C. Um, but could have a history, but just couldn't have um, actual uh, active viremia of hepatitis B or C. Um, then patients had to have uh, liver fibrosis that was less than or equal to stage two. Um, we did enroll HIV positive patients. They just had to have a, a negative HIV viral load and an appropriate CD4 count. And then um, among the patients, the patients had to be either treated uh, at baseline on prophylaxis or if they were treated on demand, um, had to be, um, you know, had to have a, a registered uh, uh, phenotype uh, in the, the year before vector of, of an AVR uh, that was quite high. Um, so generally speaking, the, the patients received the vector by outpatient uh, IV infusion over the course of an hour, and then it's followed by a couple hours of, of vital sign monitoring. They're followed on a dosing protocol for a year, and then thereafter are followed for four years on a long-term follow-up protocol um, and this is overall consistent with FDA requirements that um, uh, mandate a requirement of a, a five-year follow-up period after AV vector infusion. So um, this is the, uh, excuse me, the demographics and uh, summary briefly of, of some, some aspects of the clinical trial course of the patients. It's, it's a lot to look at. So let me break it down a little bit. So there were a total of four dose cohorts. Um, 18 um, total patients received vector um, the majority of the patients had severe hemophilia at baseline. Um, uh, four of the 18 patients were treated on demand and the rest were maintained on prophylaxis. Uh, patients were between the ages of 18 and 52 um, at the time of enrollment. And all but one patient had a history of underlying hemophilic arthropathy. And you can see some of the patients had pretty significant hemophilic arthropathy with several uh, target joints. Um, about half of patients had a history of hepatitis C, 
Um, and among those patients that had hepatitis C, they had either stage one or stage two fibrosis. And then uh, the patients that did not have a history of hepatitis C had otherwise, best we could tell, uh, completely healthy livers with no evidence of fibrosis. Uh, three out of the 18 patients had a history of HIV. And then among the 18 patients, uh, 13 of the 18 received uh, some form of, of immune modulation, all of which started with the use of steroids. And then there were a total of four patients that um, received were initiated on steroids and then re received, subsequently received steroid sparing agents. Um, and then uh, I have listed here the duration of immune modulation use, which spanned anywhere from a couple of weeks up to, you know, can see some of these patients were on immune modulation for uh, up to a year. And I'll go over the, the immune modulation course in detail. And then for those interested, I will say, um, we try to be very um, specific um, of the individual patient courses in the manuscript. So anyone interested in, in um, further detail that I don't provide here, I would encourage you to look at the supplement of the paper. Um, we have uh, each of the individual patient courses outlined um, and uh, you know their uh, factor levels, LFT values, et cetera, are plotted in the supplement. So um, there's really, like, like all manuscripts, there's really a lot of information that's in the supplement. So adverse events. Um, so a single. Um, so let's talk about safety first, I guess. So the the there's a um, a single patient in terms of eight adverse events related to the vector. Um, there was one uh, that was deemed to be. Uh, well, actually, there were two that were deemed directly related to the vector. The first was um, an AE um, that occurred within the first 24 hours um, after vector infusion. The patient experienced uh, fever, myalgia, and emesis. This occurred about uh, 12 hours post vector. Um, and was responsive to um, acetaminophen and um, symptoms had completely resolved within three days post vector. Um, similar observations have been seen now across um, several of the AAV trials, which um, you know, many have speculated may be an, a possible innate immune response to the vector. Um, importantly, again, this, the symptoms resolved, um, there was no um, you know, long-term sequelae. Um, the other thing is because this analogous um, reactions have been seen across a couple of different trials. It does raise the question of, do these patients have, um, does this uh, sort of predict ultimately courses on the trial? And best we could tell, uh, the answer is no. Um, but um, something I think that will be important to try to understand a bit in the future. Um, there was a single SAE. Uh, so one of the patients um, uh, uh, was found, I, uh, I'll go over his course in detail, but um, this SAE was related to an elective hospital admission um, for which the patient was given IV methylprednisone in the setting of having um, a capsid immune response um, with the, the goal to you know, rescue transgene expression. The bulk of the adverse events were really related to the use of steroids. And I think this is consistent with what has been seen across clinical trials, uh, other clinical trials. Um, and you can see the list of, of um, adverse events that were deemed to be related to, you, to the use of steroids. Importantly, all of these AEs resolved once the steroids were discontinued. Um, interestingly, um, there were no e a AEs uh, related to the use of steroids bearing agents. So I mentioned there are four, total four patients that received steroid bearing agents that were consisted of either MMF or tacrolimus or azathioprine, and there were no AEs related to the, to the use of these agents. Um, and then um, uh, continuing on the vein of, of safety, um, looking at transaminase elevations in the subject. So um, uh, most hemophilia trials have observed some rise in transaminases. Thankfully, there's in the hemophilia trials, there's not been evidence of um, you know, hepatic failure or, or um, symptomatic uh, rise in transaminases, but nonetheless, this has been observed across multiple trials. Um, but I'll just outline uh, our observation. So a, to a total of four of the 18 participants had, um, did have uh, transaminase elevations, uh, but importantly, these transaminase elevations were uh, short courses. So on the order of weeks, uh, not on the order of, of several uh, month, multi-month transaminase elevations that have been observed in other trials. So among these four patients, there were a total of seven events uh, uh, seven events of elevated transaminase values. Uh, six of these events were grade one toxicity. So that meant that they had transaminase elevations that were uh, roughly between two and a half and threefold upper limb and normal. And then a single patient had a grade two transaminase elevation that was uh, just about uh, threefold above the upper limb and normal. 
all of the observed transaminase elevations occurred in the higher dose cohorts, so the 1.5 and the 2E12 for vector genome per kilogram dose cohorts. And all of the transaminase elevations were observed in what was presumed to be a, a capsid immune response. So um, as opposed to other work, we, we didn't see transaminase elevations um, outside a capsid immune response. Um, and um, whether it's good or not, uh, at least we had some rational explanation for why the, the transaminases were elevated. Um, so this is looking, this is a graph of um, uh, alanine amino transferase levels and a uh, total of 18 uh, participates participants in the first 52 weeks post vector. Um, so what's plotted here, these are box plots. Um, uh, the horizontal line is the, the median transaminase values for each of the 18 patients. And then um, uh, you can see the, um, and then the, just, just so that it's a bit confusing to look at this graph, the, the um, uh, highest levels are, are also plotted here. Um, I should give you some frame of reference here. So the upper limit of normal is, is denoted here. You can see the vast majority of the levels held below the upper limit of normal. And then the numbers indicate here the subjects that had the elevated uh, transaminase values. Um, but again, I think the, the relevant observation to us was that these were non-sustained transaminase elevations that were observed in the setting of a presumed capsid immune response. Um, so just briefly, um, for those not familiar, a, a CAPS immune response um, uh, is hypothesized. The concept here is that you have, these are intended to be uh, vector protocols here. So you have um, a transduction of your hepatocytes, the, um, uh, the AB uh, uh, vector particles undergo encoding in the cellular cytosol. You have delivery of the transgene uh, expression cassette to the nucleus and then um, capsid proteins are broken down in the cellular cytosol and capsid peptides can be presented on the surface of MAC class one molecules. Um, and ultimately could, um, when detected by a CD8 T cell response can trigger a cellular immune response um, to the transduced cell, which um, if this occurs um, can result in clearance of the transduced cell and, and in doing so you lose your transgene. Of course, what we measure in the labs is a rise in, most classically a rise in, in ALT um, and a, um, a decrease in, in factor activity. Um, we similarly have used an inter interfering gamma LA spot assay um, to measure um, a zoo surveillance for this uh, evidence of a capsid immune response. So this is an assay where you uh, take patient peripheral blood mononuclear cells, they're, they're plated, um, and then you expose um, uh, the patient's peripheral blood mononuclear cells to capsid peptides and measure their interfering gamma response. Um, and, and classically, the capsid immune response has been described as a, a rise in, in your ALT value, a decrease in your uh, transgene expression, in our case, a decrease in factor rate activity, and then a positive interfering again, LA spot. Um, I think that LA spot data is, is quite helpful um, at times. Um, the problem is it's a labor intensive test, so the data often frequently lag behind um, a point of care um, of the patient. And so um, this is, uh, from a practical standpoint, is not always helpful. But I think what is reasonably sensitive is a rise in transaminases and a decline in factor expression for evidence of a, a capsid immune response. So among um, the total uh, patients in the trial, uh, as I mentioned, 13 of 18 received immune modulation. And unfortunately, uh, two of these patients lost all expression despite steroid intervention. Um, so I just wanna go over their um, courses in detail. Um, they were participant five and participant 12. Um, they both re were enrolled in the highest vector do dose cohort of two times 10 to the 12 vector genomes per kilogram. Let me talk, um, take the patient on the right here, uh, participant 12. Um, so this was, uh, this is a, a was a, at the time was a 21 year old male with severe hemophilia A, no history of hepatitis, underlying liver fibrosis, who uh, six weeks post vector developed an elevation of his ALT with a concurrent decline in factor rate activity and a positive interfering gamma LA spot to the LKO3 capsid. So, you know, sort of had a cl classic evidence of a, a capsid immune response um, for which uh, triggered steroid intervention. And while on steroids uh, for a couple of days, his ALT actually continued to rise um, and his factor activity de declined. And so there was a, a decision made to elective admit this patient for IV steroids um, and his, transam his transaminase values came down um, unfortunately, um, he, he continued to lose transgene expression as such that by, the, um, by what we think is around week 17, he lost all expression of the transgene. And, um, and you know, because he had been on steroids for uh, several weeks, uh, he 
you know, ultimately took a bit of time to, to wean him off of steroids. So this is his course, you know, this is looking at factor eight activity on the left vertical axis and ALT value on the right vertical axis. Factor eight activity is in red in this graph as well as the subsequent uh, graphs I'll show you. And you can see, you know, he has pretty um, uh, factor eight expression that went up um, to the, you know, around roughly 20% and then concurrently had this rise in his um, ALT and then um, not plotted here, but had positive LA spot date, uh, you know, a positive LA spot results. Uh, was initiated on steroids and unfortunately uh, lost uh, uh, transgene expression despite steroid intervention. Um, uh, actually around the, uh, uh, not completely dissimilar timing, um, uh, participant five is a 27 year old male with severe hemophilia A, uh, no history of, of hepatitis C um, or underlying liver uh, fibrosis. This actually interestingly was the same patient that had developed a uh, an acute infusion reaction uh, post vector um, is, is completely unclear whether that's not re that's related to his overall trial course. Um, however, week five post vector, he had an isolated increase in his ALT and um, a very modest decrease in his uh, factor eight level. Um, just looking at his factor eight levels over time, it's, it's a bit hard to discern uh, specifics here. I'll note here that this represents uh, factor eight infusion on the day of vector infusion. So. Uh, really, this is his transgene expression um, uh, after that point. Uh, so at any rate, at week five developed a uh, rise in his ALT, a modest decrease in his factor eight expression and, and steroids were initiated. Um, his ALT uh, subsequently decreased uh, what, once he was uh, initiated on steroids, um, but he uh, continued to lose uh, transgene expression despite being on steroids. Um, his steroids were ultimately tapered and discontinued by week 21. So had about a 16 week course on steroids. Um, and his factor eight activity was, uh, uh, was 1% at week 23. He had had intermittent uh, factor exposure. So the exact timing of when he lost transgene expression is not clear, but we think somewhere around uh, six months post factor, he lost all expression. So these are the, the two cases, two of the 16 men that, um, you know, lost all transgene expression uh, post vector uh, on the trial. So um, as a result of the observations with these two subjects, 15 and 12, that lost all expression, the protocol was amended um, such that the subsequent patients were treated with prophylactic steroids um, beginning uh, at roughly two to four weeks post vector. So um, the next series of patients, participants 13 through 17, were treated with prophylactic steroids. And importantly, all of these men maintained transgene expression. Um, but what was observed in these patients is that they had, um, there was difficulty getting these patients off uh, steroids. So there were observations where when you tried to wean steroids, you would see a recrudescence of a rise in ALT, uh, positive LA spot findings, and, and, and in some cases, a decline in, in factor expression. Um, that's exemplified, I think, perhaps best here. This is um, similar kind of plot looking at factor eight activity on the left vertical axis, ALT on the right vertical axis. Um, and uh, here we also have the LA spot data. Uh, factor eight activity is in red. Um, you see the patient was on steroids. And when, when there was an attempt to wean off of steroids, you could see that the ALT increased, LA spot was positive. Um, and so there was um, use of, of initiation of steroids bearing uh, agents and then, um, uh, you know, analogous course here in uh, participant 14. Again, the concept here is you, you have a, uh, you know, factor eight activity that was actually uh, well within the normal range, uh, use of steroids. And as the steroids were tapered, this little spot here, you can see his uh, ALT value rose or positive LA spots. Um, so steroids were reinitiated and then um, a patient was uh, bridged to the use of, this particular patient was bridged to the use of azathioprine. But importantly, actually, um, uh, the patient uh, was weaned off of all immune modulating agents um, at about a year post vector um, and uh, has maintained transgene expression. Um, and so uh, that was the concept where why there was some variable use of immune modulation. So the um, first uh, 12 patients were reactively treated if needed with steroids in response to evidence of a capsid immune response. Um, and because of the two patients, five and 12, that lost all expression, the protocol was amended uh, for 13 subjects 13 through 17 to receive prophylactic steroids, but uh, due to difficulties weaning these patients off immune modulation, um, uh, the, you know, the duration of, of steroid use and, and bridging to steroids bearing agents and the subsequent difficulty weaning patients off immune modulation. Um, the last patient um, was transitioned back to the use of, of reactive steroids. 
So um, that is um, an overview of the safety and um, some of the immune modulatory course and, and the rationale taken. I, I should say that the, the, the choice for um, uh, uh, tacrolimus and MMF was, was taken from um, protocols around it that are, you know, this is used for autoimmune hepatitis, which, you know, some have thought maybe this had some um, uh, parallels to the observation of a capsid immune response. Okay, so now moving to expression. Um, and so first, I think it's important, all 18 men that received vector did have expression. You know, as I mentioned, two, two patients unfortunately lost all expression, but all men did express uh, factor eight, uh, which is outlined here in this graph. Um, this is looking at one stage um, factor eight activity over time post vector. You can see that the median follow-up of the 18 patients was three years for so the range between six months and a little over four years. Um, I wanted to outline a couple points. Um, first, this is a, a logarithmic scale. Um, for anyone that's read the paper, uh, there were some sort of uh, axis breaks incorporated into the final manuscript, but the, the reality is this is a logarithmic scale. So it, it's um, perhaps a misnomer to have those breaks in the axis. Um, so each one of the lines represents an individual patient. Um, the, the value uh, at the end of the line is, is actually not a factor activity value. This is the individual subject. Um, the gray shaded area is the range of moderate hemophilia. And um, I think what, what you see here is it's in the first year post vector, it's uh, a bit complicated um, and there's quite heterogeneous course of the subjects. Um, but what I think is actually quite interesting is that after a year post vector, um, there was relatively similar courses of the patients. Um, you can see that the mean factor eight activity in, in the patients uh, you know, followed for um, beyond six months was a mean factor rate at level of, of 11%, plus or minus six, about 7%. So about a threefold range in factor rate activity. Notably, this is in the 16 subjects that maintained expression. Um, so among those 16 men that maintained expression, there was um, uh, perhaps a bit less heterogeneity that's otherwise been observed when you look at stable uh, transgene expression. Um, and then what I think, um, to me was the most important part of this work was looking at the longitudinal stability of expression. And so um, this is a, a table that's in the supplement. And, and I actually think this might be the most, uh, one of the most important pieces of data in the, um, in the manuscript. So what this outlines, so there were a total of 12 patients that were followed for um, uh, at least two years. So we picked two years because that felt like enough time that we could see you know, some evidence of, you know, other trials had reported a clear decline in expression from year one to year two. And, and we were interested in, in seeing if we saw uh, something analogous. Um, and um, so, so that, that we included patients, first of all, we had to, obviously the patients that lost all expression related to a capsid immune response are not included. And then um, there were uh, a total of 12 patients that were followed for at least two years. And so what this outlines are those 12 patients, you know, this is the vector, their respective vector doses, this is their mean factor eight activity um, from month six to month 12 versus their mean factor eight activity uh, for any time point after 52 weeks. So to the best of our assessment, um, steady state expression um, uh, was uh, achieved somewhere in the range of six to 12 months. Um, and then we were interested in you know, what happens. So if their steady state expression is somewhere around six to 12 months, again, there was actually quite a bit of heterogeneity, particularly in the higher dose cohorts, what happened between zero and six months, um, but relative steady state expression between six and 12 months. Um, and then what did that, how did that factor activity for the individual patient compare to their factor eight activity um, for any time point after, um, you know, after a year post expression. So for example, this first patient had been followed for a total of four years. So this is his steady state factor levels between six and 12 months, and then his steady state factor levels for any value after 12 months, um, you know, so from between 12 and, you know, 48 months. Um, and you can see it's not much of a difference. Um, and so um, I guess I'll just point to two values. You know, this was intended to be, you know, uh, we use descriptive statistics only, but if you took each men, each of these 12 patients and looked at their factor activity between six and 12 months, and compare that to their mean factor activity for any value after 12 months, the confidence interval actually crossed zero. So it was the 95% confidence interval was between uh, minus 2.4 and 0 0.6. So suggesting that there was not 
uh, any significant decrease in, in factor eight expression. And then if you look similarly, so that's that's comparing each indiv an individual patient to his values between six and 12 months to his own values after 12 months, and then the cumulative confluence interval of that. Um, and then if you take the aggregate data of these patients and you look at the mean factor eight activity of the whole, all 12 men between six and 12 months versus their mean factor eight activity after 12 months, there's not a major change. Um, and so this um, generally speaking suggested to us that, you know, after roughly six to 12 months of expression, you know, provided you were outside the window of a capsule immune response that there was indeed evidence of, you know, approximately stable expression. And, and I think that's an important point because the data before this would suggest that maybe you, there was some um, evidence that you know durability of expression was in question in, in factor eight. So um, I wanted to paint this in the context of available other hemophilia A gene therapy trial data. So um, this is um, compiling the aggregate data that's available for hemophilia A gene therapy work. Um, and it's, it represents published information. You can see the publications here, are data presented in abstracts and, and uh, um, single information from a press release in January. Um, and so I think you most certainly have to take this with a grain of salt, but I think there are general trends that can be taken from this. So this is a um, uh, couple of points. So first, with respect to the Spark 8011 vector, this, this is, if we're just sort of trying to conceptualize if, um, uh, you know, multi-year stable factor eight expression is indeed possible uh, in the current methods used in gene therapy. That's, that's the point of this analysis. You know, as I have mentioned now a couple of times, two of the 18 patients lost all expression. So what we instead did was look at um, the patients that had been followed for at least a year and maintained expression. So um, it, with the SPARC uh, 811 data, and this is their factor eight activity at year one um, up to year three post vector, um, there is a single patient that had been followed for up to four years, um, but you can you can see the relative uh, factor activities, and then this is the number of year a number of patients represented in each year. Um, and I think what's important is that the the pharmacokinetics look quite a bit different from um, some of the data that's available for other work. So um, the other trial data, at least what I what is available, is outlined here. There are clearly some limitations to this. Um, so I'll just take first the, the Pfizer Sangamo data. This is their uh, this data was uh, presented at uh, Ash meeting this past December. This is really only uh, four subjects um, looking at their one stage factor eight activity. So any chromogenic value was converted to a one stage assay based on um, the group's reported um, observations of chromogenic to a one stage assay, um, so that we can look at this on the same scale. Um, but you can see clearly there's a you know decline in expression, the loss of half of transgene expression in these. On, on average in these four patients from year one to year two. And then these are the data, um, available data from the uh, phase one, two trial of, of um, the Byron sponsored trial, um, looking at their factor eight activity, um, again, converted to a one stage assay over time up to five years post vector. Um, and then similarly looking at their phase three data in which there's a, um, a total of 17 patients that have been followed for three years. Again, this is one stage assay values. The, um, the values plotted here are the median, median values with the standard error measurements. So that the data are not normally distributed. So that's why a median was plotted here. Um, but I think the important point here is that um, there's clearly some variability between the trials in terms of their T factor levels, but um, and obviously it's a remarkable proof of principle that you can have factor eight expression post gene therapy and remarkable progress. But the pharmacokinetics across the trials look quite a bit different. Um, and I think, again, what was important about the, the AD, Spark 8011 data is that I think to me, the biggest point was that it demonstrated that you could indeed have approximately stable multi-year factor eight expression. And I think this is a very important point for the field. Um, when continuing to further pursue this uh, general strategy for hemophilia AG therapy. Um, so uh, now moving back to the 811 data in isolation, this is looking at the preliminary efficacy. Again, I wanna be very clear, this is, this is a, the, among the patients that maintain transgene expression. So the analysis of preliminary efficacy did not include subjects five and 12 that lost all transgene expression. Um, but among the, the other patients that maintain transgene expression, this is looking at their annualized bleeding rate um, before vector infusion and after, as well as their annualized number of infusions before vector and after. And you, know, you can see clearly there's a pretty remarkable reduction 
in um, ABR as well as infusions consistent with a remarkable improvement in phenotype among the patients that maintain transgene expression. So um, I just want to look at the hemophilia A efficacy data that's available, um, just looking at the aggregate uh, annualized bleeding rate data. And I think without question, is really quite remarkable improvement in phenotype so long as you have sustained expression. So this is the ABR data um, for the 811 spark sponsor trial, as well as the um, Bimarin phase three data um, uh, before vector, um, as well as after vector. For the Pfizer Sangamo data, there's only an ABR, to my, best of my knowledge, only available for post vector and a, a small cohort of patients. But, you know, I mean, you can see without question, there's a remarkable improvement in phenotype. So I think the the optimism is certainly there that um, we can certainly have very impressive clinical improvement. Um, the question is, you know, how long can that clinical improvement last? And, and that's why I brought up this point about neutralizing antibodies, because I think in the current state of clinical development, you'll only be able to receive one um, lifetime systemic AV vector. Hopefully that obstacle is overcome, but I think that's where we currently are in development. So, um, Moving now, I kind of alluded to this point about um, a so-called assay discrepancy. Uh, well, we, as well as now, uh, at least uh, the two other reported AAV uh, hemophilia aging therapy trials have observed um, an unexpected discrepancy in the one stage versus chromogenic uh, determined factor eight activity of transgene expression. And so, um, uh, importantly, a chromogenic assay measures cofactor function um, versus a, a, a one stage assay takes into is measures pro cofactor function. So it takes into account the kinetics of 8A generation. Nonetheless, what we observe is that the one stage assay read roughly 1.5 fold higher uh, than the chromogenic assay. Um, this is a similar observation that's been seen by other groups and other groups have um, correlated the factory antigen levels. So plasma concentrations of factory activity with the chromogenic factor eight activity. But the major question remains, which one of these values determined factor eight assay values correlates with in vivo hemostatic function? Um, and so we tried to, to do an analysis of this to see if we could begin to answer this question. So um, what this uh, represents uh, is, so what we did is we took each of the individual patients, look at their um, uh, uh, annualized uh, spontaneous bleeding events, relative to the proportion of, of time that patients had factor eight activity greater than 10%. Um, so this is a regression line of annualized bleeding rate relative to the, the amount of the proportion of time that they had factor eight activity greater than 10%. And then the, this is what the blue line represents and then the confidence intervals of the shaded uh, blue area. And we chose 10% as a threshold because there was uh, natural history data and you know, uh, severe, mild, moderate hemophilia patients that suggest that factor eight activity levels determined by a one-stage assay between roughly 10 and 15% correlates with, um, uh, you know, uh, absence of spontaneous bleeding events. So we wanted to see how our observations in these patients correlated with some general information that's known about hemophilia natural history and see how um, the two assays aligned uh, with natural history data. And what we found is that if you did... Um, um, if you looked at the posterior distribution of this, you know, so this is a Bayesian uh, negative binomial regression analysis. And if you looked at the posterior distribution um, density of the analysis um, relative to the, um, uh, the, the percentage of time that patients had factor eight activity greater than 10%, the probability that they would have an, uh, a, a spontaneous bleeding rate of less than one so long as they had factor eight activity that was greater than 10% was 99% of the time. So in other words, if you had factor eight activity greater than 10% measured by a one stage assay, you had a 99% probability of having an annualized bleeding rate, spontaneous bleeding rate uh, that was less than one event per year. Um, and so this to us suggested that, you know, the, the one stage assay of, of uh, you know, the gene therapy derived factor eight um, may indeed ultimately correlate with in vivo hemostatic function. Um, but this of course is an unresolved question. And then um, lastly, I wanted to, um, I just wanted to look at, um, because we actually are starting to get quite a bit of data, uh, phenotypic data, if you start to look at the aggregate data um, from the clinical trials. And, and this is, um, so what we tried to do here was to look at the aggregate data um, that's available. Um, with either, I'm sorry, the SPK 8011 vector that should read 
relative to the phase one, two versus and phase three clinical trial results of the um, uh, biomarin vector, which ends up being about 150-ish uh, patients. So it's looking at the uh, reported ABR of each of these patients relative to their factor eight activity. And the thought was, could we begin to start to answer, you know, there's a lot of discussion around like, what is the minimally targeted uh, factor level and you know, which factor level is ideal for, or which factor level may ultimately most reliably confer an ABR less than one or whatever clinical threshold you want to use. So I want to be cautious in this analysis, but we just looked at this to say, you know, can we start to be kind of honing around an answer to this question of what, you know, what may be the minimally targeted factor level? And, and we used some arbitrary cutoffs that we came up with. So this, we said, you know, which, um, we, so we took, you know, the data from these roughly 150 patients um, and um, looked at their ABR and their uh, one stage factor eight activity, um, again, so that we could standardize this across the trials. Um, and we arbitrarily grouped these patients, not arbitrarily, we systematically, I guess, grouped these patients into groups of 10 according to what their factor eight activity level was, and then looked at the percentage of patients by factor eight activity that had an ABR less than one. Um, and what you can see here is that around roughly 20% factor eight activity by one stage assay, you start to see, you know, roughly 90% uh, of patients have an ABR that's less than or equal to one. And so this is a very rough, rough approximation, but I thought it was really interesting to start to put together some of the aggregate data, but this is a rough, very rough approximation, but it may suggest that one stage, you know, factor eight activity measured by a one stage assay of around 20% um, may be a value that, that, that reliably confers an ABR of less than or equal to one. So um, with that, you know, the summary for the SPK 8011 work is that um, thankfully there were no major safety concerns reported. Um, um, unfortunately, two of the 18 uh, men lost all expression related to a capsid immune response. Um, I should know that all patients had some degree of expression, two of whom lost all expression related to a capsid immune response. The remaining 16 men maintained expression. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been, among those 16 men, there's been really remarkable evidence of, of uh, efficacy with, you know, a little over 90% reduction in bleeding events and, and, and factor use. Um, but to me, I think the most important uh, point of this is that the kinetics of expression, I think, are different than what's been reported by others. And, and mainly that, um, you know, once steady state is reached, the, the patients, that, at least the data that we have so far on the men that have been followed for at least two years, it looks pretty stable, reasonably stable, I guess I should say, um, such that, you know, multi-year um, you know, I think it's proof of, provides proof of principle that multi-year approximately stable factor eight expression post um, current methods of AAV gene addition um, is indeed possible. But I will say in terms of the state of the field, I mean, I think it's like this remarkable uh, progress, um, ongoing activity in the field. And, you know, I think we're, we're one step closer towards what I would consider the ultimate goal, which would be you know, safe, you know, safely obtaining sustained, stable, and predictable factor eight uh, activity in all patients that is able um, to, you know, ameliorate phenotype. Um, so to me, this is, you know, we're one step closer. This is thus far still an unrealized goal, but, um, you know, there's uh, several groups have made quite a bit of progress in this space. Um, so with that, I just wanted to thank, you know, obviously this is, I, I'm honored to present this on behalf of the whole group, but this is, you know, obviously the compiled work of, of many people um, you can outline here, you can see the authors, and then there's, you know, several people, as you can see here, um, at the individual uh, enrollment sites, as well as um, uh, the study sponsor, who are not listed authors, who are most certainly uh, key, uh, provided, you know, key aspects of the success of the work. And then, of course, uh, Kathy High, who I think, you know, many can acknowledge soup to nuts, uh, led this work. So with that, I'm, I would be uh, very happy to take any questions. Great. Sorry, I'm having my computer still lift off to space at the moment. My fan is going nuts. Um, I do have a couple of questions as I um, continue to get loaded. But for the first one, um, this individual for the great summary, the longitudinal factor eight stability is somewhat reassuring. However, the increasing aggregate data from all the trials, is there any other insight? 
into third dose optimization. Um, the factor eight expression does not seem to closely correlate vector dose in your trial. Yeah, so great question. Hi, Donna, always a great question. Um, so I think that, um, whew, okay, let me take it piece by piece. I say, so I think the aggregate data are very important um, to, to start to try to, you know, this work, uh, you know, has it's been a race, right? And I think there's a lot of people have made a lot of progress and, and I make it, you know, on a personal note, I, I sort of consider this like, let's take stop and take stock of what we know and don't know. And um, I think there's a lot of things, you know, despite a lot of success, there's a lot of things we don't know. Um, so, okay, so for your first question, vector dose optimization, I mean, you know, there's about 120 fold range of AV vector doses being used in hemophilia A gene therapy. So the lowest being dose uh, is, is uh, uh, the men on this trial, the lowest dose cohort was 5E11. The highest dose is that being used by Biomarin at 6A13 vector genomes per kilogram. Um, and actually, you know, if you consider 120 fold range of doses, actually, not a major change in the, the factor expression, relatively speaking. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. I mean, <laughs> the vector optimization is obviously the key factor here, but um, I think there's, um, you know, so many aspects, so many variables, you know, there's patient variable, and then there's, you know, manufacturing variables, there's the uh, vector cassette variable. So uh, that may take some time to achieve an answer to. Um, I think it's probably important that we start to break down this, like, you know, use the information we have to try to break down at least some of these variables. Um, with respect to subject variability, any predictors? Um, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't finish the first part of your question. Your point is well taken that there didn't appear to be an obvious dose response. And we actually um, did, um, uh, you know, a descriptive analysis of this, and actually there was not evidence of a dose response. Um, and I think that that um, in the higher dose focus, certainly. So between the, the, there were three, you know, the 1E11, 1 1.5, I'm sorry, 1E12, 1 1.5E12, and the 2E12 dose cohorts, there was not evidence of a dose response. Um, I think we attribute that to a couple things. Um, the first is, uh, there's actually not a major change in the dose. It's actually a twofold change in the dose. So, um, you know, one would hope that a twofold change in the dose would result in a twofold change in expression, but that was clearly not seen. Um, and not entirely surprising um, given what's been observed in other trials, but also, I mean, just fundamentally, like when you, when you do this work in the lab, you treat mice that are genetic clones of each other, you give them the same vector, same dose, and there's about a five-fold range in the expression you see in mice that are clones of each other, eating the same diet, et cetera. So, um, there's going to be some degree of variability that I think is just going to be inherent to this therapy. Um, obviously I hope it's much better than what we are, but I actually think among the men that maintained expression, our, our variability actually was, in my mind, actually was um, a bit better than what has been seen elsewhere. You know, these, these guys were roughly around 10 to 12% um, plus or minus a 7% factor activity. So about a three to four, three to four fold range in expression. Obviously that doesn't account the two guys that lost expression. Um, okay, subject to subject variability and expression, any predictors? Um, uh, I don't know. Um, I could pontificate on many things, but the truth is, I, I don't know. Um, to the best of my knowledge, we do not have something where we could do, you know, ideally you could do like a genomic analysis and say, I expect you're gonna have this course and I expect you're gonna have that course, but no. Um, to my knowledge, none of that has been done. And then the other thing I think that would be very interesting and important is, you know, could you predict who's gonna have a capsid immune response and who could not? Um, there are some interesting data where people have looked, you know, there's been, for a long time in the background, people have looked at maybe HLA typing and could you do in silico analysis and predict, to the best of my knowledge, um, nothing hard has come from that. Um, there are some data I think that will be published very soon where people have looked at RT-PCR of um, cytokine response that maybe has some predictive value with uh, capsinine response. But the truth is, I don't know. I, I think the, I also think that the way that we can look for is probably limited. So you know, looking at peripheral button on non-nuclear cells or peripheral cytokines, I think the reality is, is you ideally need to look, um, you know, at the site of transduction and, and it might be very hard to gather anything from a, anything that you can derive from a peripheral blood draw. Um, but obviously it would be very important uh, for the success of this therapy in the futures. And then predictors of factor eight stability. I mean, geez, that's a million dollar question or, or billion, I don't know, depending on what scale you use. Uh, I don't know. Um, 
extent of early hepatocellular information, I don't know. I, I think um, this is something I could go on about, I think, but the short of it is, I don't know. And I don't really know if anybody does. There are probably people that are much more well-informed than I am. Um, again, I think when people have looked at the available thus far hemophilia A data, the knee-jerk responses has, has been that the people that have higher levels, you know, the, the trials, whatever they've initially had higher levels of expression, don't appear, you know, have this decline in expression. And then, you know, our data, the levels are lower and they look a little more stable. I think that may be um, not the whole picture. And, and there, you know, and, and there's been a lot of suggestion around an unfolded protein response. The problem with that argument is that it assumes that the, um, if it would be attributed to an, an unfolded protein response, that assumes that the same percentage of cells are transduced, meaning the same number of cells treated with each of the vectors are producing the same amount of protein. And the reality is we don't know. We don't know if we're transducing a couple percent of cells or we're transducing all those cells. So uh, I think there's a lot we don't know. There are two important papers that have recently come out about this. this is the Nature Medicine paper from the Biomarin group, which I think is quite strong looking at um, uh, liver biopsies from patients that retreated on the hemophilia A trial. And then there's another trial looking at, I'm uh, sorry, there's another recent paper looking at uh, manufacturing techniques and, and what that may mean for uh, uh, episome, stability of episomal DNA. But I think in terms of a hard answer, I don't have one. How's that? I didn't answer any of the questions. <laughs> That's okay. That was great. That was great. <laughs> Um, well, I do want to do again for taking the time to join us this afternoon. If any of our other viewers do have questions for you, uh, okay, if they email you. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you have other questions for Dr. George, her email address is george at chop.edu. Um, thank you so much again for taking the time to join and all this information. We appreciate your time and expertise. I'd also like to thank each one of our viewers for joining us. Please know that this recorded webinar will be available on Friday 6th at helia.org under the tab with all of our archived webinars. Also available in this tab is our upcoming schedule for a weekly Wednesday webinar series. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and have a wonderful week. Take care, everyone. Thank you.